You've landed on The Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us each week as we engage the culture without the culture war. My name is Vincent Edwards, and I'm here with my two co-hosts and buddies, Trevor Aiken. Hey, what's going on? And Philip Marinello. Hey, everybody. Um, if you are returning, welcome back, Substance listener. We are definitely happy to have you back. And if this is your first time listening, we're happy to have you. I'm glad you decided to take some time to stay with us for this particular topic. Thanks for joining us. I just had a phone call today from a listener who, man, he's like, hey, Philip, uh, I don't think I agree with you and Trevor on a lot of things, but like, I love the show. He was super complimentary on the production. He goes, Sounds like a professional show. It sounds incredible. And I was like, Trevor's going to awesome. love hearing that. I really love <laughs> He's hearing like, that. He's like, I listen to a lot of podcasts. You you guys sound like a very expensive podcast. And I was like, all right. Heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Budget podcast sounding expensive. Yeah. Brought to you by the <laughs> listeners. Shout out to everybody who's joining us uh, on the monthly support. Who's hitting us up on uh, Cash App. You're helping us uh, sound good. But yeah, Thank he you. was basically just saying... I don't think I'm where you guys are on a lot of, on, on some of the social stuff, but I really do appreciate your tone and like, I want to understand. And I was like, that's, that's awesome. kind I of very that. refreshing because that. not to overly characterize, but like the, some of the folks who hold ideas that we are being critical of in public don't seem to tend to be very humble or seek genuine understanding. It's kind of reactionary. It's kind of name calling. It's frankly kind of immature and like unproductive in a lot of ways, but it mm-hmm. was it was the very best kind of conversation. Yeah. Zero animosity, like, hey, I don't think I'm with you on a whole lot of stuff, but like I want to understand more. Um, he suggested we talk to a couple of different folks specifically that he likes who are on the opposite side. And I was like, well, actually, we are it's fell through the crack twice on the scheduling, but we are hoping to have an episode where we do go back and forth with some other brothers. So that's right little teaser for the future there if we can ever get that scheduled and completed but it was a great phone call so yeah it, whether you all that. agree with what we're saying on stuff or you disagree like i you yeah, know okay so i think it's really funny because i feel like almost every single one of our interactions with our listeners starts with i'm not where you guys are at on everything and not that you have to be or we want you to be at where you super don't we're have to at be. on everything but i would challenge the listener if you're thinking that Give us the feedback on it. Like, and that's what he did. And it yeah. was it was hit us great. hit us with the stuff. Yeah, do it. I told do him it I was like, send us yeah. send us sources. If you really want to, send us gotcha questions. Like give us yeah. give us meat to interact mm-hmm. with. Don't just give us sound bites and conspiracy theories. Give us things of substance. Give us something that would convince like, okay, this is the thing that's the sticking point for me, where if you had a convincing answer to this. You know, that would be the thing that would maybe change my mind or the thing that would be like, this is the one hold up point where I just can't roll with you because you said this. Yeah. Awesome. Like, let's hear that so we can interact with that. Maybe there's something that we're <clears throat> overstating. Maybe we're wrong somewhere that we need to move. Yeah. You know, we're, or we're maybe far we from can perfect convince. people, but yeah. we definitely seek to be humble yeah. and open, very open to changing our minds when presented yeah. with. Uh, or maybe we'll just see it differently which is fine yeah depending on the issue but what i'm saying is don't like you can you can be confident listener sending us links sending us questions and knowing that like we're a safe place for that yeah Yeah. we're a safe place for that discussion engage with it yeah so that that was just i mean i've had a heck of a week with work and family and just personal stuff like Kind of gone through it a little bit this week. So when I got the call, I was like, mm, I'm pretty sure this guy doesn't agree with us on a whole lot of stuff. And I hadn't heard from him in forever. So I wasn't sure what the phone <laughs> call was going to be like. But honestly, incredibly refreshing. That's, That's so awesome. great. That's, That's super so encouraging. So when we get into issues of, of like that, where we're talking about things where it's a safe space, like I think that's kind of how we want to approach any of these theological issues as well, where... Um, we know that there's a variety, a background of different people's upbringings and views on different stuff. So we're hoping to engage well in the topic of assurance of salvation today. Yeah, kind mm-hmm. of, not, maybe not necessarily like heavy theology, but like a straight up direct theological uh, topic this time. Right. So some people ca- call this assurance of salvation. Some people call it perseverance of the saints. Eternal security. Some people call, yep. call it eternal security. Some people call it once saved, only always saved. 
Some people call it uh, You Can't Lose Your Salvation. How long is are we going to go, Vince? What you got? <laughs> Give us at least two or you're just, out of the I substance. I just had monergism. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I guess, monergism yeah, monergism, monergism kind of hits it. It probably hits some more things too, but yeah, that hits it. Um, definitely. I'm sorry. I think there's synergists who have, who also believe in assurance of salvation too, though. No, that's good. What do you think about really briefly doing backgrounds? Cause I don't know what Vince's, I, I know Vince's church background, but I don't know about his, like, what were you explicitly or implicitly taught? It, it was a, it was an interesting dichotomy because in one point there was this um, proclamation of the gospel that it is, you know, a work of God that is mm. not upon, you know, your works or anything that you can do. And it's an act of God. Right. Um, and so being saved is, is kind of the thing that the Holy Spirit does. But at the same time, um, it bled into a bit of legalism. And so that legalism was elevated to the point where if you did anything that was deemed to be morally or culturally wrong or synonymous with what's perceived as the world doing this, then in that moment, you are not saved. Um, there was even a culture that yeah. I grew up in where if you... Like th- there was this kind of terminology of I I walked away from the faith of God or I went back out in the world and I had mm. to go and I, then I you know God rescued me and I came back as if there were like two separate moments mm. of salvation. So like Protestant mortal sins, in a sense, yeah. It, it, that that's a great way to put it. Protestant m- mortal sins is kind of this thing where it's like you you basically the grace has been wiped off of you and you have to go get it back, and so it, it drove this kind of ideology of mm. um, even though it was never articulated as sinless perfectionism, it was um, almost pursued. It was to say you. You cannot like if you if you say a cuss word, if cussing is deemed as like a mortal sin and you cuss before you die, you lost your salvation. So you might not go to heaven. Wolf. Um, It was that like intense. And so it it garnered a lot of fear and it garnered a lot of uh, unassurance of my salvation because it's like if I get saved, I could lose it at any moment. Sure. Yeah, that is not enter into the rest. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Not restful, not peaceful at all. My church background um, wasn't necessarily monergist or, or Calvinistic in like earlier than late high school. I wasn't thinking that way, but it was definitely kind of the generic like Norm Geisler style Christianity where it's like when you choose Jesus, then you're in the family of God and you're you're saved. And that's all there is to it. The once saved, always saved. Yeah, once saved, always saved. And so that's definitely always been my perspective. Now, I think it it solidified in different ways around learning about Calvinism, the doctrines of grace, things like that. Mm -hmm. Started to understand it in kind of different ways. But yeah, definitely on on my end, the theology was always, no, you you can't lose your salvation. Yeah, tr- and listeners who are, are newer or uh, who haven't heard some of us talk about like our backgrounds, Trevor and I grew up in the same church uh, in Florida, and, and mine, yeah, very similar understanding, very much the once saved, always saved, like God is the sovereign agent in salvation, and when he draws you to himself, that's it. And I wouldn't say that I've changed very much, like I have, I am curious about like the idea of apostasy and like what is that and what does the scripture say about that hmm. but not like I'm, I'm i'm not saying i'm out of that camp um, and again the question of assurance of salvation is a very important one especially when it comes to our relationships with other brothers and sisters and people who are in need of encouragement yeah. it's not one that i've frankly spent i don't know loads and loads of time kind of agonizing over but i i think it's a super important topic right 100 percent so given a little bit of background in Christian salvation theology, you believe in Jesus, that he is God, that he died for your sins, that he's coming again, and that he's in charge and you should follow him. You believe that you become part of the family of God, you become part of the church, your sins are forgiven, and you are, in that sense, saved. 
you you can call yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, a little mm-hmm. Christ, and under assurance of salvation or eternal security, you would say you you can never lose that. But the counterpoint is there's people who believe that well, no, you can lose that um, just because you did all of those things like I described before doesn't mean that that's always going to be characteristic of you or that that you're going to walk in it or all these different things. So you could actually, in their, in their schema, you could be saved, but then at some other point fall away and then and lose, walk away. lose that salvation Correct. that you had. Mm-hmm. One of the things to th- that I always think about is how salvation is future tense kind of oriented. So what yeah. we're talking about is the pouring out of God's wrath on humanity, either either on you at, at death or during the great final judgment. And so what we're actually talking about being saved from is that. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of interesting to talk about being saved from something that you will ultimately experience in any sense. So that's one of the angles where I, I don't think the terminology around losing your salvation makes sense because it's like you, you, you were out at sea and you were out in the waves, man overboard, and you were rescued, you were saved, you were brought on board the ship, Mm -hmm. and then you fell off again? Or you jumped off again. Or you jumped off again. But the getting on the boat is the thing that happens at the final judgment. (laughs) Like, that's the thing. That's the salvation. So that's why it's weird. It's like, technically, but salvation, in a sense, can also be seen as a process. So Well, in another one of the the biblical texts and... Flame even had a song about it, like, no one being able to snatch us out of the Father's hand, not even ourselves. So that was something that I was kind of always taught implicitly and explicitly growing up. Yeah, let's talk about, yeah. let's talk about that text. That's in John uh, chapter 10? Yes. Yeah, the Good Shepherd. So, so John chapter 10, uh, in that passage, very interesting... So we start at, want to start at 22. Yeah, I'm going to start at 24. There were some, some Jewish folks who gathered around Jesus and asked and said to him, Hey, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, just tell us clearly. And Jesus said, I, I told you, and you don't believe me. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you don't believe me because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Mm. See, that was what I kind of, that was one of, that's maybe the most fundamental text of my formative understanding of this question. Yeah. The people who believe in Jesus are the people who are his sheep. And the father is the one who is the agent, the acting yep. agent, primarily. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, under a Calvinistic framework, that, that work would be electing them, right? Sure. And then um, Jesus says, I give them eternal life. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And my father, who is greater than all, no one's able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So he's, he's saying the father is stronger than all, and he has the ability to keep them for the eternal life that he that he talks and about. And he will. There. Right. Um, another classic text on this one that um, my pastor in Florida used um, uh, many times, and I think this is very wise, um, is Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, yep. I think Romans 8 is great for this one. Romans 8 is great. That's a shirt. Romans 8 is great. It actually really is, though. Uh, <laughs> verse 1 in the ESV says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, That's about not feeling bad about racism, right, Trev? Turns out, nope. (laughs) Um, But the idea that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then further in chapter 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that was raised, 
who's at the right hand of God, indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the question then is, if there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, how can there and later... nothing present or future can separate us. How then can you later be separated from Christ Jesus and bear condemnation from Christ Jesus in losing your salvation? 100%. So I think one thing that I've heard um, to be the biggest, I guess, conflict with the assurance of salvation um, is definitely there's an argument to be of whether or not you can lose it. Mm -hmm. I think more um, there might be a wrestling that a lot of Christians have Mm -hmm. of, you know, they did something or they said something, they believed something, they thought something, um, they had a particular type of attitude or behavior at a certain point and they're just feeling off. And Mm -hmm. sometimes in those moments, the question then comes up, am I actually saved? Yeah. And so what, what, what's you guys' kind of articulation to, to someone who might have had a moment or moments where uh, the assurance of their salvation actually comes into question because of how they assess their lives? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a whole lot in there, isn't there? I mean, mm-hmm. like, our salvation, the salvation of man— who like is inherently sinful by a holy God, like our our salvation isn't based on like how we feel. True. Mm. Not that feelings aren't important, not that we don't want to be in touch with them and seeking to like submit them to the Lord. Like that's see the bulk of the Psalms. Sure. So God is good and like the the way we feel is not determinative of anything. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But I mean it's it is a good question. Like I, I think when those things happen a lot of times it is pointing us back to holiness, not our status. Yeah. The thing that is the most, I won't say convincing, but the the question that is, again, I haven't looked into this very much. Um, Not sure if I, like when I would be able to look into this, but the idea of potentially like making a conscious choice to be like, you know what? I'm out. I reject this. Like that's kind of a little bit interesting of a question to me, but Mm. not like I sinned and I'm out. Like, God, if God is the agent acting before existence was, yeah, God had complete full knowledge. It's not like God is like, okay, I saved you. Oh, you did a big bad sin that took me by surprise. Yeah, kind of yeah. I'm gonna react to your sin right. and change yeah. my well my deal. Yeah, and I think thinking about what Vince was talking about earlier about how he was taught this kind of mortal sins almost theology of sure. hey for example to use use the oh if you cuss before you die you're not saved but the thing is we're sinners and salvation the whole idea behind salvation is that there is forgiveness of our sin mm-hmm. right that there is wrath against sin that is rightfully due that god is going to forgive because of christ's sacrifice his substitutionary sacrifice he's going to forgive us Mm. and so really what what it is in a sense if you understand salvation that way then to believe that oh well if i curse before i die then i would lose that salvation what you're essentially saying is that that salvation of christ that forgiveness that christ gave you that christ won for you on the cross that that time when he took your place and took took your sins on himself he missed one right that like somehow he he took 98 percent yeah percent of your sins but somehow missed that forgiving that one and so sorry you're gonna have to bear the wrath because of that sin Hmm. and so no that doesn't work that yeah that that obviously doesn't doesn't make sense theologically of what we see in the text so yeah and i think there's a the huge balance that uh, it, it, it helped, it helped me because that was a huge question coming out of that kind of culture when I actually did become a Christian. And I wrestled with that horribly for the first several months 
um, because I grew up in a, a very charismatic church. And so attached mm-hmm. to the assurance of salvation were gifts of the spirit, um, revelatory gifts of the spirit, meaning you should mm. be able to speak in tongues. And it usually speaking in tongues is like primary. If you don't do that one, you, you're basically not saved. Mm. Um, and so, you know, having an experience where I know my heart has changed, but that, you know, phenomenon not particularly happening drove me insane mm. because I was like, I, I know that how I believe, how I feel, how I understand what I think, like the repentance aspect, yeah. I know that's kicked in in a way that has never kicked in before, but I didn't, I didn't, you know, say shambla, bambla, bambla. So it's like, <laughs> well, boom, you like, got it what? now. It took all these years. <laughs> What a burden, bro. Like, man, I'm just, I'm feeling legitimately like just heavy, just hearing about that. Yeah. Yeah, It was tough. It was very tough. But I, what I I say that in a sense, God definitely brought some, some solution and peace in in that arena. Um, But I can, I can definitely sympathize with the person who slips up and, or, or the feelings of it. And it's like you said, Phil, you hit the nail on the head. (laughs) it's not surrounded by feelings. That's yeah. not, that's not the justification. That's not the metric we should be leaning on, but there is a balance of how we assess our walk with Christ. Yeah. I th- we say this on the podcast all the time. There is a holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And I want to get to that too. And I also want to say just to balance out, because I know you brought up the charismatic side and, and the, that kind of upbringing in that background, mm-hmm. but the reality is exactly the struggle that you described can be descriptive of people within the reform tradition. For sure. People who grow, because, because here's how it sounds. How many people did we talk to in college ministry? So many. And in like, just life. This yeah. is what it sounds like for them. It sounds like, am I elect? Maybe I'm mm-hmm. not one of the elect. Like, yeah. wow. did I like, man, I struggle with X, Y, Z, my temper's this and that I have X, like I have this or that besetting sin. Mm-hmm. I haven't been reading my Bible too much. Like, I don't feel like I'm living like Christ enough. Mm-hmm. And therefore I'm like, well, did that one time thing ever happen? Like right. it's people, I mean, so it's a hard life to live. So they're theologically not thinking about, can I lose my salvation? They don't believe anyone can lose their salvation, but their, their whole question is whether or not they're just in Christ. Yes. So primarily. Yeah. So in a sense, the, the theological wrestling just gets transformed. I mean, not theological wrestling, really personal soul wrestling. The theology maybe is a little bit more in line with biblical text, but the personal impact of it can still be. I I don't know kind where of I stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, it's tough. I think. So what do we, what do we say to people struggling with sin? Going, man, I'm not doing my devotions well. <sighs> man, the whole personal holiness thing. I'm probably not doing like all the things that I need to be doing. I'm probably slipping on whatever my own besetting sins are, and like I'm just not doing holiness good enough. Yeah. What do we say to those folks? That's a good question. <sighs> I've been reading on Eric Nevin's suggestion nice. recently uh, with by Sky, Sky, Sky Jotani. And, and if anybody hasn't heard the uh, Eric Nevin's episode, that wasn't super good. If you like testimonial yeah. stuff, if you like unshackled radio broadcasts or things <laughs> like that, it's very, we go into some of that stuff with him. So but, listen to Eric's episode and listen to the episode that Eric recommended specifically good. on the super show. Good. Also, an it's in the show, show notes, right? Yeah. So back to you, Trevor. So uh, no, no. It nope. will be. Oh, uh, yes. right. I don't know. It will be. But in this, in the book that I've been reading, kind of he he describes different postures towards God and how what you're describing, Philip. This I haven't X Y Z enough, and so I'm not saved. Is almost kind of life for God. Like I need to do all these things for God to appease Him. And ultimately, we do have a a life that God has called us to. That I'm not saying you just go and live however you want. That doesn't matter. Yeah. But God calls us to life with him, right? Alongside him, together with him. And that is a life that experiences the grace of God and the forgiveness. And because of that, walks in newness of life. Nice. Does that make sense? So like, it's not, it's not about how can I purify myself to be holy enough to get into God's squad, but it's about 
because of what Christ did on the cross and making me perfectly pure, now I get to walk in communion with God. And walking in with communion with God looks different than walking without God or walking yeah. opposed to God. Are you enjoying with? I think it's really good. It's one that like piqued my interest, but I have so many things on my read and watch list. But yeah. it's it's one to add. Yeah, it's super good. Um, I, also, shout out to Sky. Love to have you on the show sometime, bud. Yeah, there you yeah. go. It's almost like that. Uh, you used to hear that saying, "I get to, I get to do something rather than I have to do something." It's a it's like you said, a different posture. And the way that interacts with a person who's struggling with assurance because of sin struggles is a couple of ways. One, it extends grace to them because it's saying, hey, the Lord knew you were going to struggle with sin. And he didn't beam you up to heaven and make you perfect instantaneously Correct. because part of his plan, honestly, for your sanctification, for your growth, for your usefulness in this world as a representative of Christ in a way was to have that real struggle that, that people relate to. Mm was to be able to to see his power at work in those things. The other thing, too, is because the thing about grace, whenever you talk about it, and this happens in the scripture, too, you see the difference between Romans 5 and Romans 6, is people mm -hmm. want to run with it as soon as you give it to them. It's like, oh, well, I have grace. Well, then that means that it, yeah, I, I don't crazy. have to reform yeah. at all. Like, there is yeah. no new thing. Then I can like, just live wild because I'm covered. Like, let us sin so that grace may abound. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm yeah. saying, hey, man, you're good. Like, you punched your card with God, and so just don't even worry about that stuff. Yeah, I'm going to get I into fist say fights, that. sexual morality, who cares? Right. Like, ethics when it comes to business, I'm just going to do whatever because I'm covered. Right. Yeah. And so, That's not it. And so it really does come down to, to the individual. I'd say to the person who's struggling with these things, get people in your life who know you, you know, because people struggle with this for different reasons. Some people just, just sure. doubt. They don't even know what they... That's just like, that is such a good point. Yeah. Like somebody's circumstance, somebody's upbringing, somebody's... I can't somebody's, do that for you. I don't want to say like mental state, but like just... Yeah. There's so many different things that can go into why somebody would struggle. Yeah. So yeah. if you're if you're listening to this, uh, I would just really encourage you. It will be worth it. Like if you can't be vulnerable in the faith community that you're currently in, please find a faith community where you feel able to be vulnerable. Because that's that can so be a necessary. struggle in some it's of so the very hard. reformed it is hard. communities. But find it, if it's not just a whole community, at least find a person. That yeah. you can just be your real self to and talk about these things. Because the reality is we can give a bunch of theology, but we don't know your background, your history, how you grew up, how you were raised, your engagement with the text, your thinking theologically. To be able to answer all those questions in a way that's really going to be ministering to your soul, we can lay down some general theological groundwork, which is what we're hoping to do here. Exactly. And we're yeah. hoping this is beneficial so far for you. Yeah. But that would be my, if for soul care... We can't be that for you. And so find someone who can. Find someone who, who you can open up with and can care for you in that way. Because yeah. here's the thing. Christ wants to do that. Mm -hmm. Christ wants, he, he has ordained, there'll be people in your life. He'll be somebody that he can bring along. Or even just through the Holy Spirit and in the text yourself, just asking the Lord. The Lord doesn't didn't design us to be on this on our own. And that's why like he wants to extend that soul care to you yeah absolutely and i can say that confidently because he says that in his word mm -hmm. 100%. And I, I i would also give the encouragement to that person who is uh doing a little wrestling struggling sometimes that moment and and i speak from experience sometimes that moment um where it comes to my mind um provoked or unprovoked to read my bible or just hmm. turn off the TV and, and, and get alone with God. Hmm. Um, sometimes I, I, I feel like that's, that can be the Holy Spirit can, mm -hmm. getting, getting at you and saying, I'm getting your attention right now. Hmm. And a habit that um, my wife Elizabeth and I are working on doing better is when that thought comes up, just stop and do it. Don't wait and be like, oh, you know what? It's wow. a good idea yeah. to read the Bible, but I'm going to do that a little later. I'm watching the show right now. That's good. Or listening to Super this thing good. right now. It's like that could, for whatever reason, 
I am not sovereign. So I don't know why the Lord would be doing that in that moment for that reason. But um, yeah. building good habits <laughs> around certain spiritual yeah. practices is a is That's a not good the devil thing. tempting you to read your Bible. That's, exactly. That's true. So it's that's like, true. If, if you get that moment, rather than delaying it, rather than putting it off, and, and I'll tell you straight up, that's still something that we are working on. Um, but hopefully over time that gets better, but you get that inkling. I need to pray. I need to, um, read my word. I need to turn on some worship music and just get quiet with the Lord for a second, but don't delay, go do that yeah. thing. Um, That's super and, good. and I, I would even encourage that the Lord would, would bring some just peace and, and refreshment in those moments. Yeah. Where I want to turn to from this is kind of thinking about where a lot of people, would probably push back on this. And I think that that is in real life experience because the reality is, I mean, all of us have been in church long enough to have people not just, not just like maybe go to a different brand of Christianity or things like that, but just straight up walk away from the faith and not just people who, not just people who were always on the fringe of church, not just people who weren't involved, weren't living it, Pastors, uh, leaders, teachers. But like, yeah, people, I've seen that. I mean, I don't. I watch someone very close to me and my wife in particular. Oh yeah, literally, just you know, kind of dump her marriage and pretty much peace out. That hmm. was somebody who was involved in discipleship. That was somebody who was, was involved somebody who was in involved premarital in your counseling. Guys's, like yeah, personal faith. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So, so this is the struggle for people because. Basically, under our schema, we're saying that person just was never saved. Or she'll come back eventually. Yeah, or exactly. Or she's just on some sort of, yeah, backsliding thing right now, but she's still saved. And we'll give some evidence to that. Because ultimately, your your eternity is binary. Like, right? Yeah, it is. So, yeah. How we live. 100%. So she either is or she isn't. And that's always been the case. Right. Like, uh, exactly. It's the whole question of whether or not we're losing our salvation is, is how one is eternal destiny is manifested in our practice now. Mm. Right. Like that's what we're talking about. And so when you see somebody who's been in what looks like the house of God, what what looks like in Christian living and then kind of dumps it, it seems, it feels inadequate to say well, once saved always saved well hey so once saved always saved so therefore therefore this person just never was saved it feels inadequate to say that they were never saved sure yeah so would what would you guys do with that like do you say well actually i do say they just never were saved and here's why or do you say well it's complicated what other text would you bring in to kind of give color to it yeah I was actually thinking about that as you were explaining it. Man, it's a tough one. I'm not going to lie. Because I think ultimately you're getting to the heart of the individual. And that's, you know, something that is not, not completely impossible to make an assessment of, but we can't do it the way God does, clearly. Um, but the scripture that comes to my mind is... Um, Matthew 13, um, the parable mm. of the, the sower, I believe it's called. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it talks about... Nice. These... I had the other one in my mind. Perfect. You hit this one. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it talks about the different seeds that go on different soils. And, you know, one springs up again uh, with the thorns and um, one is uh, had no root and withered away. One was scorched by the sun. And um, and then obviously one fell on good ground and grew and, and good soil and it was great. Um, and so in this particular situation, uh, starting at verse 18 of Matthew 13, um, Christ actually explains what that means. And it's, it's only a few verses, so if you guys wouldn't mind, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it very quickly here. Go for um, it. And so uh, starting at verse 18, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for the one... 
As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and then tribulation, persecution arises um, on the account of the word, and immediately he falls away. Um, and as for the what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. And then finally, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and another 30. So Mm -hmm. when a person comes to me and then that comes to my mind, the reason being is obviously at some point in this person's life, they heard the word yes the the message of the kingdom right but we don't know where that seed fell we don't know what kind of soil this person was and it's very easy when reading scripture that things kind of just happen one for one very quickly and so it's very easy to assume that okay well if if they're going to be any of those situations that's not the good soil then that's going to happen fairly quickly Um, but I, I don't necessarily believe that because a a real seed needs time to grow or not grow depending. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a thought or at least a thought process I would take a person through of getting a better understanding that the person who professed salvation, um, might have heard it and ran with it, but a particular situation as described in these passages might have happened. And then that's why that person's walking away because the soil wasn't good. Like the time will tell yeah. what type of, of seed that is for the metaphor. Exactly. I always thought it was interesting and it took me a while to see it, but on, on the one that Vince just mentioned, that last soil that Jesus mentions, mm-hmm. the, the, the point of the parable is there is a greater amount of time that the seed remains before it is declared basically ineffective in each one, right? The first is snatched away immediately. The second one springs up quickly and then withers, so it dies quickly, but it did have a chance to spring up. Mm-hmm. The third one, though, the third one grows up for a long time. Yeah, for a while. And, mm-hmm. and the, only, the only thing is that the cares of the world choke it out slowly so that and and notice the big thing is so that it can't produce fruit right and so that can happen i mean that could happen over a lifetime sitting in the pew in church with someone who looks faithful Mm. so so i think that's um that's a key characteristic maybe the answer from matthew 13 is like maybe we need to think about our categories of salvation a little bit more robustly because even holistically we are thinking of like, oh, wasn't that person saved? The Bible says, oh, well, you could have somebody who could grow up for a long time, but just not really bear fruit. I mean, that's like yeah. Matthew 7, right? Like the most terrifying passage in scripture of like... Matthew 7 goes further, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. people saying, people who have done faithful lives and ministries going, well, Lord, we did all these things in your name. And he's like, I never knew you. Like, depart from me. It's Is like, that what you have pulled up, or did no, you want to... No, I have 1 John. Do you, do you mind if I read that really yeah, quick? Yeah, go for it. That's yeah, like so. this legitimately terrifies me every time I read it. So he's talking about false prophets, and a lot of times we think about false prophets, we think about people who... Charlatans, things like yeah, that. Yeah, people who make bad predictions and stuff like that. But the other thing, too, about false prophets is that there are people who teach things. There are people who are ministers who are teaching. Like prophets in Israel were people who were ministering and teaching the Word of God. And, and they're false in the sense that that ministry is not really what God wants that ministry to be. Hmm. So so try to try to break your like image of false prophet to just be really anybody who's doing ministry work. Hmm. And so he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, so they look good, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. How will you know what's on the inside? Well, you'll recognize them by their fruits. So that's kind of the same thing we were saying. I'm going to skip along to verse 19. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And I almost feel like there should be a however right here. And then it, he says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven 
but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, now listen, didn't we prophesy in your name? These people are are claiming we... Didn't we do ministry? We spoke, we did ministry in the name of Jesus. Yeah, man. Didn't we cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Didn't we 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 do... We effectively did these things that people saw. It is on record. Like... These were true... This is true ministry that we did. And stuff Mm -hmm. that our charismatic brothers will say, the power of the Spirit of God was there. Was apparent. Yeah. We did these things. Jesus will declare to them, you didn't do that. No, that's not what he'll say. He doesn't deny their claim. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers. Notice, workers. He gives them the title workers. Yeah, sure, you're workers. Workers of lawlessness. Mm. So sometimes, I, I think that's why, like, we have to... Even for folks who are in ministry, I think especially folks who are in ministry, who are in ministry we have to think about Long the view. impact of that because that, that's another characteristic. Even when we think that we see fruit, Jesus says, yeah, you'll know them by their fruits, but these people, their fruits they thought looked good, but I'm telling you it was works of lawlessness. Terrifying. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time here, but the passage that I went to was um, 1 John 2. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, starting at verse 15, he says... Do not love the world, nor the things, uh, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the mm-hmm. love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the flesh, the eyes, the boastful pride of life, that's not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So, talking about people who, whatever you want to call it, leave the faith, it says, they went out from us in 19, but they were not of us. Yes. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be complained that they are not of us. Um, and then skipping down to the end of that section, but the anointing that you have received from him in 27 abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true and it is not a lie, just that it is taught to you, abide in him. So it's about Remain like our hearts, where our Christ. affection is. Do we love the world and mm-hmm. are we abiding with yeah. God? Mm. I don't want to point out what you highlighted in verse 19 he's talking about a rift in the church that he's ministering to where a group of people broke off fellowship from them and um did not continue with them anymore you know almost like a church split in a way and just kind of like your example through through doctrinal these people who were like faithful followers of jesus Mm -hmm. who now are like i'm out that is not me anymore and you're like How do I reconcile that? And John does say, yeah. if they had been of us, if in that of us is of the same family, John uses this metaphor of family of God, that we are sons of God uh, versus there are sons of the evil one. And he says, when we are in Christ, when we believe in Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. And so this of us means of the family of God. They, they weren't of us. And that's why they went out. So even he has that that similar language of, well, this shows that they weren't saved. So even though that language sometimes doesn't jibe with our experience, I think it still does jibe with the way the text would describe it, because I think Christ has a nuanced view of what does it look like to show salvation, and it's not always evident to us what it'll look like. If somebody, whether or not, a man or a woman loves God, or whether or not they abide in God. We can't know that. We can't truly know that. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to touch very quickly, because I'm sure if somebody comes to this um, from a theological point of view and, and is denying eternal security, they're going to want to hit Hebrews 6. Yeah, absolutely. And so Hebrews 6 talks about... Um, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. But then he goes into verse 4. For, this is why we want to do this, it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Hmm. And then he gives another analogy, which is actually really a good analogy. I don't know if I have time to read it all. But basically, then he says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. 
things that belong to salvation. And, and the argument goes, when you describe the people who have, quote, once been enlightened, quote, tasted the heavenly gift, quote, shared in the Holy Spirit, quote, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. When those people fall away. The, the, the argument is that that description is describing, can only describe people who are saved. Right. Interesting. Okay. And yeah, so, sure. And so this, they, they would point to this text and say, well, doesn't this say that people could fall away? And I think the, the basic rebuttal is, no, it doesn't. Like, it doesn't describe, only describe people who are saved. I think it only describes people who have been deeply involved in church, um, deeply involved with the Christian community. But I don't, I, I wouldn't say that it only describes people who have actually been saved. Got yeah. it. And I've heard I think that's a super I've important. heard some people pair it together and say, well, if you are going to believe that, then what follows behind says after they've fallen away, it's impossible to never restore, restore them again to that's repentance. Right. So if you that's are right. going to hold to that passage and say, Well, that's the passage that says you can lose your salvation. Well, then it also it, means you can you never can't, regain like, it. Yeah, once you can't once skip fallen, the part always that says fallen. you can't come back. Like, that's terrible. Yeah, that's a good call out, Philip. Once I don't know, in case fallen, people was fallen. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrifying. Yeah, and and there is a sense of ultimate apostasy that's talked about in a few of the the New Testament books. We don't have a chance to go into today on this episode, but uh, yeah, I do think the the sense of Hebrews six is what more do you have to see? If you've really been fully involved in the life of the church, if you've understood, and that's why he's using all this language, saying that, look, you, you saw the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. You had the experience of the, of the faith community. Like, you saw the powers of the age to come. You heard the word of God. You, you saw it active and living among you because that was the work of Christ and actually changed lives in that community. And you were a part of it, and you were jiving with it, and then you decide, eh, no, Christ, Christ's sacrifice wasn't for me, or Christ didn't actually sacrifice, or he wasn't really a Messiah, or all these things, because he, he was dealing with, remember, a Hebrew community that was being tempted to leave behind Christ, but keep the law in Judaism for, for acceptance in their community. Mm-hmm. He's saying, listen, if you've been in the midst of all this, and then you throw Jesus out, what more is there to convince you? Well, yeah. Like, you've seen it all. There's no, there's no new presentation. There's no new argument. There's, there's nothing more to give to yeah. that person. And if that person's unconvinced, there's, no, there's nothing else mm-hmm. to do. And, and the author of Hebrews says similar things in chapter two, um, I, honestly, throughout the entire book. So yeah. um, that's how I would understand that passage. I think that's a better way to understand it in the context. But I, I do get why. And I think, but I think it is helpful because. If if all those things can be true of someone and they and they actually not be saved, like that's exactly what the kind of thing that people see and and are you know get worried about. Sure. Yeah. So I know I know this is a super deep topic, so we can't go into all. But I guess my my final encouragement would just be to seek to like like in um, Phil's verse, um, just seek to love the things of God rather than the things of the world, and that's not perfect that's not perfection that is not that's not your works saving you because if if it's grace that saves you if it's by grace through faith then that's also what's going to keep you um but we still ought to seek to love god through obedience very much and i wouldn't want to give cheap assurance or encouragement or platitudes Mm -mm. but i've heard so many pastors say this and i think there is a lot of shepherding truth to it if that if listener, if you or somebody close to you in your community is struggling with these things, going, man, I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm loving the world or I'm not abiding with God the way I need to. And like, I'm worried and concerned. That's kind of not the heart that is being described mm-hmm. as somebody who's, at, I'm not saying, oh, you're great. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your holiness. Don't worry about your spiritual disciplines. No. Mm-hmm. But like the heart that goes, man, like, I really want to make sure I'm abiding yeah. in God. That is not the heart that is yeah. is running away from. Yeah, taking your stand before God seriously, taking his word seriously, taking his moral standards seriously. Not typically a mark of somebody who is disconnected from the life of God. 
Yeah, and those who are also struggling uh, with that, I, I definitely encourage listen to our episode uh, we did with Barnabas Piper and get his book um, on doubt. Very um, much so. I think that's also a great resource to um, to kind of have in your arsenal when when those thoughts come up. And that's a great transition um, to some shout outs there. I still haven't other read, good resources. Um, Barnabas's um, doubt book, but that is it looks really good. Like I uh, I'd agree with that if. If you're struggling with that one, go go check that out. What have you been reading or listening to recently, Phil? So Substance Shoutouts. We've been talking about this a bunch. I don't know if you've jumped on it yet, Trevor, but uh, what I want to shout out this week is a podcast I've been listening to. There's only two episodes out. It's uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill from Christianity Today. Man, it is a wonderful, wonderful show. Um, Christianity Today podcast puts it out. It is most, it, I mean, it's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, um, famously Mark Driscoll's church in Seattle, and it it, it grew, it, it blew up, it was like the hottest thing in the world, and then it was because it was built on him, he had character issues, he had a whole bunch of stuff, and then it just kind of died. So Mike Cosper is the guy who kind of runs that show, writes it, produces it, did the research. It's an incredibly well-researched and well-sourced show, but it's heartbreaking. Like if you Man. love the Lord, if you love the church, if you if you want to see God do his redemptive work through the church in this world, it's a hard show to listen to, but I think it's a necessary show to listen to. It looks at mm. aspects of American evangelicalism, aspects of the mega church model, aspects of leadership structure that are based on charisma versus character. There's a lot of different themes it addresses and because this was so recent everybody's still alive pretty much they've got a lot of firsthand audio interviews kind of a uh, like a post-mortem on the church and again heartbreaking but essential and really excellent stuff and Chan- um i talked to mike today actually his chance um down the road he'd be interested in talking to us when the show is getting closer to wrapping up so awesome check out the rise and fall of mars hill wherever you uh, get your podcasts Great. Uh, Vince, what about you, bud? So um, this week, I'm getting back to my music. Um, <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> and uh, I... Bless the playlist. Out. Oh, yeah, exactly. I want to bless them. Um, but I I want to shout out a guy named Mike Grizzly. And you spell his name M-Y-K-E-G-R-I-Z-Z-L-Y. Um, Mike Grizzly... <laughs> This guy, he's he's a young guy from uh, Columbus, Georgia, and he's a, like an independent um, singer, artist, producer. I mean, he does it all, and he's so he's he's a very humble guy, but he is extremely talented. And I've I've just been kind of consuming a lot of his stuff, and he's got some newer things that are gonna be coming out, as well as uh, some of his older projects. And he's just phenomenal, such a smooth voice to listen to, but so articulate in his production and just how he does music it's 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 really a blessing to watch so hit us um, uh, with a project or two to start with yeah you always so, throw out uh, artists and i'm not like well where do i start yeah so he, i think uh there's a few months ago he did uh a single called beach day um with uh alc and lavon bib um, and it's just a track and it, it was, it was really good, just smooth, um, kind of a pop R and B song. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of, one of, uh, his greatest songs, um, and collaborations so far. Um, so he's definitely on the up and come up and, and, um, he, he'll, he'll do a lot of good things and I'm excited for his future. So, uh, Mike Grizzly. Dope. Chev, what about yourself? So... I am listening to a Holy Post series that they're doing. They're kind of producing it a little bit differently right now. Mm-hmm. Called, uh, it, They're featuring the author of Jesus and John Wayne, Kristen Dumez. And here's the deal. So I started listening to that book, and something about the style or tone of it, I just... I didn't really fully trust it, I guess, is the word for it. Like, I just, I don't know. I, I, was, I was listening to it. I didn't disagree with anything necessarily, but I just didn't really know if I could take it and run with it and, like, explain it to somebody else. Um, so I kind of put it down. 
I was just like, I don't know if I can rock with this all the way. It just gave me a vibe that I that I wasn't getting. But her on the podcast with Sky kind of doing the interview has been really great. Um, and so I would say, I don't know if there's other people who felt that same way, but the things that they are explaining about the 20th century and what how that influenced Christianity, how hmm. Christianity... And 1999 was not in America, did not have the same shape, culture, and flavor as the Christianity in 1901. And there's reasons for that. There's things that happen. There's a lot of explanations of movements and things that that go into it. Um, and I think that just gave some really great context. And you really got to see in the podcast. I felt her scholarship come out in mm. a way that that really resonated. So. I really recommend the podcast. Phil Vischer has obviously got his hands on it. He did like this absolutely silly. I was going to say, almost, was it like a goofy song? Or yeah, something? there's just like this goofy intro music with Phil. whips and his it's almost over the top. To children is phenomenal. I, he yeah. is he's a natural born minister to children. This song that is basically introing and outroing this very serious podcast will minister <laughs> to your children if they're in the room. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and put it that way. Um, well, you heard it here, folks. Yeah, but it looks great. The podcast is I, good. Uh, episode great. one started playing, and I was like, I'm, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> I was, I just finished listening to another Holy Post, and then it went right to, I was like, I need to get something lighter or listen to yeah, some music. Yeah. So it's on my queue. It's super good. Nice. Awesome. So update on uh, the support uh, campaign we're doing this year, the 21 in 21. As of this recording, we are still at four of you listener supporters who Thank are you so much. wonderful and we yeah. love you at, and that's uh, folks supporting at the $5 or higher amount. If you've been listening to some of the old episodes, I have been saying it wrong. I've been corrected by our corrections department. <laughs> you cannot sign up for any monthly amount via the anchor link. Check out the anchor link in the show notes. You can sign up at $1 a month, $5 a month, or $10 a month. And we are looking at trying to get 21 supporters by the end of the year in the $5 or higher amount. So currently we're at four, uh, 17 down. If you feel led, if you enjoy what we're doing here and want to kind of take part of it going, hey, I appreciate you guys trying to deal with truth and the Bible and the world in, in humble um, genuine ways, like, and you want to be a part of that, uh, join up there. Or the other thing you can do, kind of like our online tip jar, is our cash app at dollar sign the substance pod. Got a little extra cash, or hey, you really like this episode, want to throw us some bucks, you can do that. Or hey, on uh, Twitter, Instagram, people giving away free cash all the time, and somebody saying, hey, throw out your <laughs> cash app for us, throw out ours if you want. <laughs> if we just get random money saying, hey, somebody put your name in, uh, we will appreciate it. Yeah. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Substance Pod. Um, there you will absolutely be able to follow us, follow our content, um, know about the guests that we've had or the guests that we will have. Um, sometimes you can even lob questions at them before we have an interview. Um, th love that's that. also where our giveaways are going to be. And we have had some thanks to Phil and all the people that he can network and work with. Um, we've had some a fantastic giveaways um, it's pretty so true. if you want a chance uh to be a winner of those giveaways in the future absolutely follow us on the socials um that's also a great place to engage us um because <laughs> we we talked about a heavy subject today we often talk about heavy subjects including the subject of whether a hot dog is a sandwich and so mm -hmm. um we really want to know what you guys think this is a, a community show and we we want to know what's on your heart we want to know what's on your mind um the best way to do that is either create a post and tag us or hit us up in the comment section. So engage with us on social media. Absolutely. Yeah, we know uh, Philip talks about the uh, talked about the corrections department earlier. The errors and corrections and omissions department is you guys probably. <laughs> um, so if you if you have things that you want to call out, or if you have questions, or um, honestly, we talked about earlier too. If you're that person who thinks oh, I, I rock with you on some things, but not on this, that, and the other thing. Email what you need to hear on this, that, and the other thing to the substance pod at gmail.com. 
Also, mm-hmm. tell us what you agree with. That's not yeah. a waste and really encourages us as we are very yeah. part-time and really trying to put everything we can into this. Yeah, what we want you to do also is call our phone line, 913-703-3883, and then tell us all the ways that you are completely astounded and convinced by how much a hot dog is a sandwich. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> And we'd love to hear you do that. Mm. And uh, we'll be looking forward to that. And we'll see you next time on The Substance. Peace. What I, I say that in a sense, you know, that God bring, bring, you know, or brought a Branded lot of you out of it. Yeah, he bring me out of it. <laughs> no. <laughs>